anyone who you know that says they've never had to taste a little bit of discouragement is most likely telling an untruth. In other words, he's lying. I don't know anyone in any walk of life, in anything, at any time, who cannot become discouraged. All of us, no matter what we do, can become discouraged or can experience discouragement from time to time. Now, discouragement can come in diverse forms and various fashions, but at the root of discouragement, you lose confidence in yourself. You lose confidence in yourself or you lose confidence in the way you do something, the way you go about doing something. And let me tell you, preaching is no different. If you ever meet a preacher who tells you he hasn't been discouraged, you have my permission to say you're a liar. You're lying. I know better than that because I've experienced a discouragement on my job. You know you've been discouraged from time to time. You know you've been discouraged in your private life, in your public life, whatever it may be. Now, it's not just preachers who have discouragement and who are discouraged. Everyone goes through periods of discouragement. Do you think people in Bible times were any different? Do you think people in Bible times were really that much different than us? No, they were human beings. I want you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 20 is what we're going to look at. Sometimes we have seasons of joy, seasons of happiness, but then there are seasons of discouragement. And friend, let me tell you, Jeremiah had one long season where no one really listened to him. Everybody hated him. Everybody thought he was crazy. Sound familiar? Jeremiah was far from being the crazy one. Look at me in Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse number 7. This is Jeremiah the prophet, Jeremiah the man of God, Jeremiah the preacher. Jeremiah 27, Jeremiah says, O Lord, thou hast deceived me and I was deceived. Both those words deceived really more along the lines bring the idea of persuaded. The Lord doesn't deceive anyone. But he was persuaded and Jeremiah was persuaded. And I was persuaded. Thou art stronger than I and hast prevailed. I, Jeremiah, am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil. Because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. What are you going to do when discouragement comes? Look at verse 9. Then I said, I will not make mention of him. I don't have anything else to say. I don't have anything else to preach, Jeremiah says. Nor speak any more in his name. That's by his authority. But, here's a good but, by the way. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire. Shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. You imagine having a fire in your bones? You imagine having a fire pulled up to your chest? What would you do with it? You'd get rid of it. You've got to let it out. You've got to let it go. The word of God was like in Jeremiah's bones as a burning fire. How do you get through discouragement? You keep preaching. You keep doing that which is right. How do you get through discouragement in your own life? You keep grinding it out. Tonight's sermon we choose to entitle Fire in My Bones. And our text was Jeremiah 20 verses 7 through 9. And there are going to be four C's. Which we observe tonight about Jeremiah through this book. Number one, Jeremiah was sent to condemn don't think that Jeremiah just walked in and said, Hey, everybody, everything's okay. Just keep living how you want to live. Let me go back over here and hide up under this rock. Uh-uh. Jeremiah was basically the last word to the southern kingdom of Judah 
before they went into captivity. God sent one last prophet, the weeping prophet, Jeremiah, and they did not listen. Number two, but Jeremiah was also sent to construct. That's the thing about preaching. It'll condemn, but it'll also construct. Jeremiah's message was not just do. There was also some hope there. If the people would do what the word of the Lord said. Number three, Jeremiah was compassionate about his work and about God's people. Every preacher has to be that way. You have to love your work, but you have to love the people with whom you work with or it won't work. Jeremiah was compassionate. Number four, Jeremiah was despised because he contradicted the false prophets. Number one is condemned. Number two is construct. Number three is compassionate. And number four is contradicted. Now let's get started. Open your Bibles with me to Jeremiah 1. Let's see what happens in Jeremiah's life here. Going through every book of the Bible, we're trying to get... As much as we can of an idea in one sermon about the book, and then we talk about it a little bit more on Wednesday nights. But number one, Jeremiah was sent to condemn. And I think this is obvious to all people. You cannot build a house to code when the foundation is shoddy. Do you understand that? You cannot build this building to code if the foundation is off. Now, many times in our spiritual lives, our foundation is off, and we want to keep building. Friend, you're waiting for a disaster. It's going to fall and it needs to fall. When we build upon an unsound foundation, you can bet disaster will, dis will result. Now what happens in our spiritual lives? What happens in our spiritual lives when we don't understand one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. What happens when we don't have that foundation and we keep building? Friend, preaching has to condemn. And that's what Jeremiah did. Look at me in Jeremiah 1, beginning in verse 7. But, this is after Jeremiah's call, the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. Jeremiah may not have been what we call a child, more along the lines of a child in experience. That is from preaching experience or prophetic type work. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Do you see what a preacher is supposed to preach? The word of God. Do you think Jeremiah did that? Read the book. That, thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Verse 8. Be not afraid of their faces. I'm telling you. One of these days I'm going to have me a preacher cam up here. And just spam. And scan. And let you see. Be not afraid of their faces. What does the Bible say? For I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I put my words in thy mouth. That's miraculous inspiration. Jeremiah was an inspired forth teller of the Lord. Verse 10, here's where we get our condemned. See, I, that's Jehovah the Lord, have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms. Watch it. To do what? What does preaching have to do sometimes? Sometimes in order to build, you have to tear down. Sometimes in order to build up, you have to make sure that foundation is solid. Look at it. To root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down. Then look. And to build and to plant. Now what had to happen first? What had to happen before there was building and planting? Something's got to be thrown down. Some things have to be ripped down. In the walls of our mind, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5, we build up preconceived ideas and preaching has to pull those down. Oftentimes you get accused of negative preaching and it has to be that way. There are times you have to fix the foundation in order to build. Now what happens? And think of this. What good would it do to tell a man to repent and be baptized when he doesn't even know who the God of the universe is? You're going to look at a man and tell him, you know the Bible says in Acts 2.38, you need to repent and be baptized. And he's like, man, I don't even, what are you talking about? What good would that do? 
So we have to make sure that foundation is sure. We have to know and be able to give sound reasons why I know that God is and that the one true God is the God of the Bible. Can you do that? Can you give, if I were to ask you, one-on-one, -on -one, friend to friend, not yelling and screaming and hollering or pointing at you, but say, can you give me some good reasons why God is? Can you give me some good reasons why the God of the Bible is the only God that has ever been or ever will be? Do you understand that? What happens even with our religious friends who say, well, I believe in the God of the Bible, but then say, How do, you, do you know that the Bible is God's inspired word? Well, yeah, how do you know? That's what granddad said. That's what mom said. Some of us think Paul carried around the King James Version, <laughs> which would be nice, but he didn't. And I think we understand that. Do we understand those things? I hope so. Jeremiah was sent to condemn. So, a sorry foundation results in sorry converts every time. Preaching must shake the foundation of a man to see what is there. Jeremiah knew he had to tear down in order to build up later. Do we? Do we see that? Number one, Jeremiah was sent to condemn. Now, number two, but Jeremiah was also sent to construct. Now, it should be just as obvious to all that when the foundation of a house is up to par and meets the standard, guess what? It's time to build. Don't just let the foundation stay there with nothing on it. The foundation's good. It meets the code. Let's go. Do we see that? It's time to move forward. When the foundation is sure, care and diligence is still required, but in different areas and upon different things. Now, can we relate that to our spiritual lives? Well, sure. I should hope everyone or almost everyone in here has a good Solid, firm foundation. So we need to move on from that. Look at Jeremiah 1.10 again. One more time. Yes, Jeremiah was sent to condemn, but he was also sent to construct. The Bible says, from the mouth of Jehovah, see, I have set this day, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down. But that doesn't, that's not where it ends, is it? It's not okay just to go make a mess. And throw things down. We got to build too. We got to get our foundation right and keep on building and keep on growing to build and to plant. Look in chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Yes, Jeremiah was also sent to construct. Gospel preaching has to build up also. But you cannot build upon a shoddy foundation. But when the foundation is right, brethren, let's build. Let's go. Let's put some walls up. Let's get a roof on this thing, right? Jeremiah 3.14, turn. Oh, backsliding. There are some who say the Bible doesn't teach that God's children can backslide. I haven't counted them exactly yet, but you wait and see how many times backsliding is in the book of Jeremiah. It's all over. Turn, oh, backsliding children, saith the Lord. For I am, uh-oh, married. Do you see that? Married unto you. And I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Verse 15. And I will give you pastors. I haven't counted this yet, but you'll be amazed how many times the word pastors is in the book of Jeremiah. You know that's their shepherds, their spiritual leaders. I and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you. Do you see that? With knowledge and understanding. Now, in our spiritual lives, when a man believes and knows that Jehovah is the one true God and that the Bible is how God speaks to all men today, why could he not understand? Repent and be baptized Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Now, once we have, once we understand, only God is Jehovah. Jehovah speaks only through his inspired word. Yes, uh, the natural revelation, we can look and see the, the sun, the moon, the stars, the grass, the trees, everything, and know that there is God, but the God of the Bible is the one true God. When we understand that, what hinders us? 
from being baptized. Well, we talked about that some in Bible class. Understand this. A sound foundation is mandatory to result in converts who will last. Do we agree with that? I do. Sometimes we realize these things too late. And brethren, let me tell you this. Do not ever think that denominationalism is okay. Do not ever think that denominationalism is okay. It's not. It confuses people. They think they're okay when they're not. It's not okay. Denominationalism is a terrible, terrible, terrible sin. And it is difficult, if not impossible, to teach out every false doctrine from a person before they supposedly repent and are baptized, but we must try. We must give our best effort. What do you think Jeremiah did? Jeremiah went to God's people, but they were worse than the heathen in some ways. They were sorrier than the sorry. Jeremiah became a little discouraged, but what did he do? He had that fire in his bones. He kept grinding it out. Jeremiah was sent to condemn Jeremiah was sent to construct. And now number three. Jeremiah was compassionate about his work and God's people. This is key in understanding. Jeremiah was God's last word to the southern kingdom of Judah. That's it. There had been prophet after prophet after prophet. Isaiah, maybe even the greatest of the prophets, not named Moses or Jesus. There had been Isaiah, and what did they do? Nothing. Maybe they had to improve a little here and there, but overall they stayed sorry. So here comes Jeremiah. And Jeremiah came to the rebellious house of Judah, and Jeremiah knew, he knew, that if they wouldn't listen to him, that great terror from the north, Babylon was coming. Babylon was coming. They would be dragged off into captivity. For the full amount of time. Seventy years is what Jeremiah said it had to be. Now, do you realize now why some have probably heard Jeremiah called the weeping prophet? You think Jeremiah was a crybaby? You think he was a sissy boy? You think he just got his feelings hurt every five seconds? No. He loved the Lord. He loved his people. And Jeremiah saw the big picture. Big picture, I'm the last one coming. You don't listen to me, you're gone. Now look at Jeremiah 9 and verse 1. Those who refer to Jeremiah as the weeping prophet, that does have a biblical foundation. It does have some merit. Jeremiah 9 and verse 1. Jeremiah says, Oh, that my head were waters, and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep. Day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Did Jeremiah love the Lord? Obviously he did. Did he love his people? Was he compassionate toward them? Very much so. Look at chapter 14 and verse 17. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. He wasn't crying because he was a crybaby or a sissy boy or because he got his feelings hurt every five minutes. He saw the big picture. You don't repent and turn from your wickedness, you're gone. You're going into Babylon for 70 years at least. Jeremiah 14, 17, Therefore thou shalt say this word unto them, Let mine eyes run down with tears night and day, and let them not cease for the virgin daughter of my people is broken with a great breach, with a very grievous blow. Every preacher worth his salt understands what a soul is worth. Jeremiah understood the value of a soul. Would it be wrong for the preacher to cry? Well, you may not want to answer that. You may not want to. Most people, if the preacher cry, he'd call him a crybaby. He'd call him a sissy boy. He'd say, what's wrong with him? He must need pills or something for his mother. He can't keep himself together. Wonder what they said about Jeremiah. They mocked him. They ridiculed him. Day in and day out. Was he a crybaby? No, he wasn't. Was he a big sissy? No, he wasn't. 
Did he wear his feelings on his sleeve every five seconds? No, he didn't. He saw it. He understood. I'm it. This is your last chance. If you don't get this, you're gone in the same manner. Every member of the Church of Christ needs to have a heart filled with burning desire to do what is right and to help everyone see what the truth is. Do you understand? The big picture is heaven or hell. There's the big picture. Are we compassionate about our people? Jeremiah was. Do we demonstrate our compassion one to another? I hope so. We need a heart filled with compassion because a heart filled with compassion will always do whatever it takes to help. And remember, there are times when the most helpful thing to do is condemn. You've got to pull down some things, but you also need a time of construction, a time to be built up when the foundation is right. But we must always be compassionate, as Jeremiah was, about his work as a prophet, really a preacher, and also about God's people, number four. Jeremiah was despised because he contradicted the false prophets. And let me tell you, the false prophets were abundant in Jeremiah's day. Their basic message was this. Peace, peace. Y'all ain't got nothing to worry about. Everybody's okay. I'm okay. You're okay. We're okay. Let's go hand in hand and just follow la 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 our way to hell. That was their message. Then their message sort of, I guess you could say, changed a little bit and said, well, maybe, maybe Jeremiah's right, okay? Maybe y'all, if y'all don't change, maybe y'all are going to go into captivity, but it won't be but just a minute now. Y'all may get dragged off into captivity, but it, it won't be but just a little while. And everything Jeremiah said contradicted them. Jeremiah said, it ain't okay. I'm not okay because you're not okay. And you're not okay because of sin. And because you're living this way, you're going to Babylon. And you're going to stay there at least 70 years. Do we understand that? Let's look at Jeremiah 6. Verses 13 and 14. Even God's people, the priests and the prophets of God's people, turned into false teachers. Turned into flat out liars. They said what the people wanted them to say. Tell us it's all right. Prophesy unto us lies. Give us smooth things in the book of Isaiah. Same crowd right here. Jeremiah 6, 13. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone, this is about God's people, is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, Everyone dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, what? Peace, peace. What does the Bible say when there is no peace? That's what a false prophet does. We need to despise a false prophet as we despise their false teaching. I want you to look at me also in chapter 14 again. Jeremiah 14, verses 13 and 14. Jeremiah contradicted the false prophets. And we'll see in chapter 25 where that happens. Jeremiah 14, 13. Then said I, that's Jeremiah, Oh Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, You shall not see the sword, neither shall you have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. There's the message of the false prophets. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Verse 14. Then the Lord said unto me, the prophets prophesy lies. You think people will lie to you in the name of religion? No. No, they wouldn't, would they? Yeah. The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their. Can you dupe yourself in the realm of religion? <laughs> Read 2 Timothy 4 and see what happens. You want to believe a lie? Read 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 to 12. You want to believe a lie? You'll find somebody that'll teach that lie. And you won't have to go far. You want to believe a lie? Go ahead. You want to believe the truth? What's left? A lie. Look with me in chapter 25. 
Jeremiah's an interesting book. Jeremiah 25 and verse 11. It's going to be 70 years. You're not going to go there for a week. You're not going to pull a weekend in Babylon. You're not just going to have a little time. You're going 70 years. And this whole land shall be a desolation. Jeremiah 25, 11. And an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon. How long? 70 years. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon. You see what happens? God will use the heathen to punish his people, but he'll still punish those heathen. Don't think they get away with it. They don't. I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it a perpetual, make it perpetual desolations. I want you to turn with me to the New Testament book of 2 Peter. And this will be the only thing we look at in the New Testament in this sermon, and that's okay. 2 Peter, the second chapter. If I were to entitle 2 Peter 2, I would entitle it, uh, the second chapter that is, False Teachers. You get a pretty good description of false teachers in 2 Peter 2. Now some of us think it's just the false teacher who will be punished. Oh, no, 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 no. You follow a false teacher, guess what? You get the same thing he gets. Same thing. 2 Peter 2, beginning in verse 1, but there were false prophets also among the people. Did not Jeremiah prove that? Yes, Peter knew that. Even as there shall be false teachers among you. You mean there will be false teachers in the church of Christ? You better believe. Who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. That's King James language for you there. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Look at verse 18. Friend, don't hold company with a false prophet, with a false teacher. He will damn your soul every time. You be careful what you listen to on the radio. You be careful what you watch on TV. That influences us. 2 Peter 2, 18. For when they, false teachers, speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, that those, those that were clean... Escape from them who lived in error. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are what? The servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. And you can read on there for yourself and see. Do you see why Jeremiah was despised? Do you see why gospel preachers in some places, maybe not so far away, are despised even by God's people. The truth cuts, man. It cuts going, it cuts coming back. But it's right. And the Bible is right. Everything that God tells us to do is right. What have we talked about? Jeremiah had a fire in his bones. Do you? Jeremiah was sent to condemn. But he was also sent to construct. Jeremiah was compassionate about his work in God's people. And Jeremiah was despised. Because he contradicted the false prophets. Do we have a fire in our bones about the word of God? How long can we keep quiet? Do your co-workers know that you're a member of the body of Christ? The body of Christ? Do your co-workers know that you are a faithful member of the church of Christ? Do they? Why not? How long can we keep quiet? You know, certain medicines taste terrible on the way down. Don't they? Some of them have some tough side effects, but they do the job. In the same manner, no one ever said that the truth was always pleasant, but it's what's best. Will you let the truth of God work in your life tonight? Hear the gospel, Romans 10, 17. Believe the gospel, John 8, 24. Repent of sin, Acts 17, 30. Confess the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Confess his deity, Acts 8, 37. And be immersed in water for the remission of your sin. Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, Acts 22, 16, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, 1 Peter 3, 21. How much more evidence do you need? The Lord only built one church. He named it and claimed it. He died for her. Will you become one of those blood-bought children of God? The choice is yours. Choose wisely as together we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.